Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited to continue our series as we go around the world speaking with various space agencies. And today I'm pleased to feature JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, with an interview featuring astronaut Dr. Kiyoshi Wakata. But before we get to an interview with Dr. Wakata, I'd like to present the space journey of my friend, Josh. This is Josh JX, and uh, when I first fell in love with space, I was probably like eight years old, and uh, I was visiting the uh, Butler University. And if you've never been to Butler University, they have this giant, giant telescope that you can literally see like space dust on the moon. It's ridiculous. Um, and they showed us actually through the through the telescope and using a very specialized filter on top of other specialized filters. They showed us the sun, and that's when I knew that I was uh, destined to uh, really love space. So I would say that I'm most excited about understanding potential life on other planets uh, and knowing and, and knowing and figuring out what's out there. To say that we are alone in this in this crazy discombobulated world that we live in is like taking a little teeny drop out of the ocean, putting it under the microscope and saying, that's it. There has to be life on other planets. And if it hasn't visited us by now, we're going to go and find it. And I'm really stoked to figure out what's going on. Your Space Journey. Thanks, Josh, for sharing your story. Folks, we'd love to hear your space journey. If you'd like to share it with us, just give us a call at 1-317-862-4700, or you can email us an audio or video clip. Just send that email to info at yourspacejourney.com. Now for our interview with Dr. Ricotta. Dr. Ricotta has accumulated 347 days in space, spending four missions, setting a record in Japanese human spaceflight history for the longest day in space. He has flown on three space shuttle missions and a Soyuz mission and became the first Japanese commander of the International Space Station. Dr. Rikata has held several key positions with JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, including serving as JAXA Vice President and Senior Advisor. Online Coffee Break All right. <laughs> Konnichiwa, Dr. Wakata. Konnichiwa, Chuck-san. Uh, very nice to, uh, to meet you. Yeah. I, I appreciate you joining me from Japan. I, I wanted to ask you, if I may, we always like to ask our guests how their interest in space began. And I understand that you were born in Saitama, Japan, and then you went on yes. to aerospace engineering. But where did your interest in, in space first begin, if I may ask? Uh... Yeah, that was when I was uh, five years old, when I saw the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Of course, uh, you know, at the time there was no Japanese astronauts and no Japanese rockets. So, uh, of course, it was some kind of dream uh, for me and for a lot of people around the world. But uh, for a small boy in Japan, I thought it was something that is beyond my reach. But uh, thanks to the international collaboration, cooperation, especially on the International Space Station program, I was able to join um, the... uh, uh, space flying a team and uh, I was very fortunate. I was lucky. See, I think that's incredible because this is before JAXA was ever even established. If, if I uh, understand the history right, um, at that time you were selected in 1992 as a candidate, astronaut candidate by the National Space Development Agency of Japan. Um, and then, you, of course, you went on to fly the shuttle uh, three times. You were on a Soyuz. Uh, how did JAXA begin, if I can ask? So uh, the JAXA was established in 2013. Um, uh, NASA was uh, part of the three organization that merged into JAXA and the uh, Institute of Space and Astronautical Sciences as well as National uh, Aeronautics Laboratory. Uh, um, those uh, three organizations joined uh, to form the, uh, the new JAXA in 2003. That's how it was established. I think it was a natural uh, course of uh, uh, integration efforts to strengthen the uh, the, the technology in uh, space and uh, aviation or aeronautics in Japan. See, I think that's wonderful. Now, I, I do want to ask you a little bit more about your space experience too. Um, being, uh, you went, you have several records. You sent, I believe, one of the longest records for a Japanese in space. 
Um, what was it like being on the space station for, I think it was six months at one stint? What was that experience like for you? Um, it's a... Uh... It's like a marathon that uh, you have to keep your so you have to you know keep a uh, very good pace of yourself so that uh, you don't uh, burn out in uh, six months because every day we are really busy uh, working on experiments and observation and uh, quite often we have to do a lot of maintenance tasks uh, inside and outside of the uh, space station mm -hmm. and we have cargo supply vehicles arriving and uh, docking so uh, every day is different and uh, so uh, it seemed to me like it was as if it was only for a couple of weeks. Really? It did not, I did not feel that it was uh, for six months because we were so busy. One thing that I love is I've watched some of your videos about how you give advice for people going to the space for the first time. And I, I guess one thing that I thought was really impressive is you said almost, yes, you know, take, take video, but put the camera down and sort of take it in with your, with your eyes and your heart. Can you describe what it's like to go to space? for the first time, or even just continue times? What's it like? Um, still, I re really uh, vividly remember uh, when I first uh, launched on the Space Shuttle Endeavour back in uh, January of 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it was the first time. I had no idea what it would be like uh, to, to launch and you know feel the gra zero gravity. But uh, the acceleration inside of the Space Shuttle was pretty magnificent. <laughs> it was very interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, very strong jolt that uh, launch pad, and uh, it was only just three Gs for the uh, ascent uh, um, loading. But uh, was the uh, first time that I was uh, able to experience that kind of a, a big acceleration for an extended period of more than eight minutes. Wow! Uh, and the view was so magnificent. Of course, uh, I have seen pictures and videos of the beautiful whole planet many times on TV and the movies. But the first time in your naked eyes to see that uh, home planet, uh, it, it was beyond description. I could not imagine. I hope one day that a lot of our uh, viewers and listeners out there will be able to experience just that. Um, now, obviously, you trained as an astronaut with, with NASA at first, but you've also been involved with JAXA for training astronauts. I was wondering if you could tell some of the differences between sort of NASA training or similarities between NASA astronaut training and JAXA astronaut training. Um. As far as the uh, training in JAXA for human space uh, flight is concerned, uh, it's focused on the uh, Japanese experiment module Kibo. Yes. Uh, its systems and uh, uh, experiments utilization part is uh, is trained in Japan, and uh, but other than that, like uh, launching and returning to and from space, uh, all of these trainings uh, are done in either, either Houston in the, at NASA Johnson Space Center mm -hmm. or in uh, Russia uh, in the Gagarin uh, Training Center, Cosmo Training Center. So um, a Japanese uh, part of the training is uh, somewhat limited compared to uh, what we are taught in the uh, United States and at NASA. So uh, we are really focused on uh, uh, maximizing the utilization of the space station, especially in the Japanese keyboard module. And uh, so uh, I think the methodology of teaching and uh, training astronauts uh, is very similar, I think, between JAXA and uh, United States, but the scope or the areas of uh, uh, the training coverage is different. Have you noticed also, obviously, since uh, JAXA has grown, I know it's changed tremendously since 2003 when it was first started uh, being established on that. Um, have you noticed changes in just the number of Japanese that want to become astronauts since then? Well, uh, remember that was in 2003 uh, when JAXA was established. Uh, Around that time, we have experienced some uh, mission failures of uh, space operation, like in the launch vehicle operation and satellite operation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the beginning, uh, for about 10 years, uh, from 2003 to 2013 time frame, uh, we uh, you know, needed to overcome the accidents you know, and sure. technology issues uh, on the HTUA launch vehicle number six and also Earth observation techn technology satellite uh, uh, meter number two. And those things have uh, occurred uh, immediately after the uh, establishment of JAXA. So, um, you know, we have introduced uh, uh, like a technical management system, such as uh, system engineering and uh, like uh, safety mission and assurance. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, those are done in addition to the conventional project management. And thanks to all these efforts, uh, we were able to uh, deliver uh, successful results for launch vehicles and a satellite operation. And also um, in the space station program, in the human space program, that was the first time that Japan entered the human space program. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that results of these successful series of successful uh, events like assembly, launch and assembly of the Kiba module, uh, Kornotori spacecraft, that's a cargo supply vehicle, the space station. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to those results, uh, now Japan is considered as a reliable partner of the, uh, the program, um, you know, uh, of the International Space Station program. So there's a huge difference between uh, the level of uh, technology in human space uh, exploration when I became an astronaut right. and, and the current status. And I have to just commend the space program, the JAXA space program in general, because you've had so many wonderful missions. There's some active missions going on right now. Um, I might pronounce this wrong, but Hayabusa 2 was launched in 2014. It actually rendezvoused with a near-Earth asteroid, and it's actually bringing samples back. I believe they're scheduled to return to Earth in late 2020. Is that still on yeah. track as far as you know? Yes, exactly. So uh, it has been a very exciting mission. Yes. And uh, Hayabusa 1, the previous version, was also a very exciting event. Uh, you know, it uh, had to compensate for a lot of uh, uh, systems failures, but the, uh, the Hayabusa 1 uh, safely returned the samples uh, to Earth. And uh, Hayabusa 2 is the successor of the Hayabusa 1. But uh, it's been really ex uh, exciting to see the, uh, the touchdown, two touchdowns that uh, the spacecraft made on the asteroid Ryugu. And uh, yeah, and it's scheduled for a return to Earth uh, later this year. So it's really exciting. That is very exciting. Again, congratulations on that. The other mission, Thank you. That, no problem. The other mission that I'm really excited about is Icaros. It's the uh, interplanetary kite craft accelerated by radiation in the sun. Launched in 2010, this was the first spacecraft to successfully demonstrate solar sail technology. Again, Jax is behind that. That's what an incredible accomplishment. Yeah, so uh, human space program, satellite uh, launch vehicle, and also in uh, space science, we are working on uh, challenging missions. And um, some of the examples are the ones that you mentioned. And uh, Icarus is, uh, is another one. And uh, for the moon part, we are launching a spacecraft called uh, uh, SLIM mission, Smart yes. Lander for investigating the moon, that is scheduled for launch in 2021. And uh, we will be demonstrating a pinpoint landing technology on the spacecraft. And uh, for Mars, uh, we are now developing the MMX, that's Martian uh, Moon Exploration Mission. Uh, that will be visiting not the, the Mars itself, but the, uh, the Martian moons, the Phobos and Deimos. And uh, so the purpose is to uh, elucidate the origin of the Martian moons and then also the evolution of Mars. So uh, these kind of activities will compensate the entire uh, space science for uh, planetary science uh, in, uh, um, in the framework of international co collaboration. So I am very uh, lucky to be part of this excitement uh, together with all the partners of the uh, space exploration. That is wonderful. And I understand too, you mentioned MMX. I believe that it is actually going to collect a sample from Phobos to return yes. that to Earth. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, already, I think with the Hayabusa 1 and the Hayabusa 2, we have acquired the uh, technologies of uh, sample return from uh, like a lower gravity uh, uh, objects like uh, asteroid and uh, Phobos and Dimas. And of course, this will be a Phobos uh, sample return. And uh, compared to the Martian gravity level, it's uh, of course much smaller. So uh, we can apply the technologies that I consider very matured already from Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 uh, to the uh, MMX uh, uh, mission. So um, I am very, <laughs> Looking forward to seeing the results. That's amazing. And again, in all these missions, there's still even more exciting ones. Uh, I believe there's one called JUICE. It's uh, designed to explore uh, Jupiter icy moons. And that one, again, you're working with partnership, I believe, with uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, and the USA. Yeah, exactly. So uh, all of these space science missions, majority of them are uh, done in international partnership. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, we are... Um, 
working with uh, NASA, ESA, uh, CNES, uh, DLR, and other uh, space agencies in this effort. So uh, not only in the Human Space Program, which I am in right now, um, uh, Institute of Space and Astronautical Science, ISS team has been working really closely with all the, uh, the scientists and engineers around the world to, uh, uh, to uh, acquire a very beneficial outcome in space science. That's wonderful. Now, we obviously, we just witnessed um, just a couple of weeks ago, really, um, the cr successful launch of SpaceX Crew Dragon Demo-1 tests. And I understand that you have a, JAXA will be sending an astronaut on the first operational SpaceX Crew Dragon mission, Crew-2, perhaps later this year. Um, what's the response been to, to that, to SpaceX in Japan, if I can ask? Yeah, it's been... Uh, uh really exciting to see the SpaceX launch and uh, has always been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, Elon Musk's team uh, has done an incredible job of, uh, you know, <laughs> developing a, a launch vehicle uh, in such a low cost and uh, and the human part is uh, very exciting. So Ichinoguchi is scheduled to, uh, you know, to fly on the, yes. the, the first operational uh, Crew Dragon. So uh, of course, uh, whenever a Japanese astronaut uh, launches on a spacecraft, uh, it creates a lot of attention and excitement among the, the people in Japan. So this is another very exciting one and uh, um, very different. Of course, it's the first time that uh, Japanese astronaut uh, will be on board a uh, commercial spacecraft uh, that was made, made in the United States. So yeah, I'm really uh, anxious to see that, uh, very excited. That is going to be exciting. I want to ask this too, because again, you mentioned in the beginning, you were just five years old when you saw Apollo 11 land on the moon and you decided to pursue your dream for, I guess, aspiring astronauts out there that uh, maybe think that dream isn't attainable. What would you tell them? How would you encourage this generation to, to go for it, to try to become an astronaut? Yeah, when I was uh, five years old, I saw the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, I had a strong longing for flying in space. And I thought it was impossible for a small boy in Japan uh, to fly in space because uh, there were no Japanese astronauts. But I was really interested in space and uh, aeronautics. And I studied hard in science, math, and then uh, studied uh, aeronautics. And as a result, I was able to become an engineer in the airline uh, industry. And then I was able to eventually become an astronaut candidate. So, uh, Find who you are and what you're really interested in. And uh, from that, set a clear goal. And uh, and even if you fail, uh, never give up. And a dream will come true. And uh, thanks to the international collaboration, there will be a lot more people from all over the world who will join the international um, space exploration. The ISS uh, International Space Station Program um, uh, celebrates 20 years anniversary this year of continuous human presence. Wow. And uh, with that partnership, uh, we will continue to explore space internationally to, to the moon and Mars and beyond. So um, I hope uh, many of you uh, will be interested in uh, uh, working and flying in space together. Wonderful. My last question, if I may, would you ever like to go to space again someday? Yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's my dream. Um, although I thought that each time when I flew, I thought it was my last flight because I put 100% of my uh, energy into one of them. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll be trying to do the same thing if I can uh, get to fly in space again. Well, that's wonderful. Again, I want to congratulate JAXA for just all your wonderful compliments. Dr. Wakata, I want to thank you for taking time to join us today. Again, Domo Thank Ariyato, you very thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Online Coffee Break. Well, I really enjoyed my interview today with Dr. Ricotta, and I love hearing about the current and future amazing efforts of JAXA. If you'd like to learn more, just go to their website at global.jaxa.jp. I want to thank Dr. Ricotta for joining me. I want to thank uh, Josh for sharing his space journey earlier on in the episode. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank you for tuning in today. We really appreciate that. If you could share this episode with a friend, we'd appreciate that too. Meanwhile, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.